Is God a vindictive bully? How could Exodus 21 allow the beating of a slave? What about Deuteronomy 22 commanding a woman to marry her rapist? What about Jephthah and the sacrifice of his daughter in the book of Judges? These are just a handful of the tough Old Testament passages my guest, Dr. Paul Copan, and I are going to look at today. We posted a video about a week ago, and we took an in-depth look at Dr. Copan's new book, Is God a Vindictive Bully?, and invited questions and challenges and clarification from believers, skeptics, and everywhere in between. And Paul, boy, did we get some responses, some great questions, some great challenges. You ready sure. to dive in and do this? Sure, absolutely. All right, well, let's start with perhaps the most common question people had is they cited Exodus 21, 20. And let me read it and then get your thoughts. It says, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not avenged, for the slave is his money. How can it be okay for a slave owner ever to beat a slave? First, we need to remember that the term servant is better, even worker. Uh, it's a contractual hire here where there is an indentured servitude. And keep in mind that this is a, in all likelihood, an Israelite that's disputed. Uh, could be uh, perhaps uh, you know, someone using the term Hebrew or whatever, which would be a, for a foreigner, possibly. But uh, the, we, could, we could mention that, one, the punishment that goes first is often ignored by the critics. If he is, if this servant is struck so that he dies, he shall be avenged. That's the typical word used for judicial capital punishment. And we will talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, so, so for murder, judicial capital punishment is indeed in place. So we're not talking about a piece of furniture here. We're not talking about someone who is just a piece of property. Yes, there is a legal contract, but that doesn't reduce him to a uh, to, to mere property. So typically when people ask this question, they ignore that first portion of the verse and jump immediately into the second one and act as though that first portion, the capital punishment uh, question, because this is a obviously a, a morally valuable human being, if he has been struck and killed, then the then that is the death penalty for the person who struck him. So, what about the remainder of the, that passage? So, if he, you know if he walks around for a couple of days, then uh, the the point here is, and judges are able to make these sorts of assessments, that the the intention was not to uh, to murder, uh, but it may have been a you know, obviously a, a, an angry reaction. And so uh, keep in mind too, that this comes in the context of accidental injuries. And we've just read about someone whose medical fees are being paid due to accidental injuries. And Harry Hoffner of the University of Chicago, uh, he was uh, a Hittitologist, uh, so well-versed in the ancient Near East. He talks about the uh, that this is common. We do have parallels in, uh, say, in Hittite law codes where there is a, uh, a, a fee for someone who has been injured, a medical fee that, it, this, that is being paid for by the, by the employer. And so if, and again, the question is when it says he is a silver or pay, you know, or, or it could be translated that is his silver. So it could simply be taking that medical fee that is being utilized in the previous verse and simply you know that using that pronoun for it and that is the reference to if the person who has struck him is paying for his medical fees you know that is his silver then this would be seen by the judge as an act of concern rather than you know that there is some underlying hostility against the servant. And so therefore, this would be taken into consideration by a judge who is looking into this case. And I think we talked about this last time that if there is uh, some, you know, even if we say that he is his silver, let's say that the servant, well, it's sort of like you're, you're benching a, an NBA player 
for you know who for maybe some capricious reason, and the, you know of course the team owner you got, you talk about the language of team owner and and so forth uh, mm-hmm. he's uh, he's been been bought by this team and so forth, and yet you keep him on the bench. It's really just harming your pocketbook. We could say that that. And that benched NBA player is his, you know, is his dollar, you know, his, it's his, you know, it's his wallet. Uh, so he's actually just do, undoing what the point of hiring a servant is. So if you're, if you're going to harm someone, do injury, then you're only harming yourself. You're only harming your pocketbook. And keep in mind too, that we have uh, in that same chapter mention of the servant who's eye is gouged out, whose tooth is knocked out, that in that in the case of that kind of an injury, that person gets to go free. So again, that passage is typically not mentioned when this one is quoted. Mm. Uh, it is all very kind of highly selective. And the same thing, same thing happens, we mentioned this last time, in Leviticus 25, where you have mention of acquiring servants from other nations. But we're we, what is left off in that passage is verse 47, which continues to say, if this uh, servant or this person who is sojourning among you becomes a person of means, he may actually hire as a servant an Israelite. Now, it's not ideal, but it says that he could acquire him. Now, it doesn't mean that the Israelite is mere property here, no more so than those who are foreigners are acquired to be servants in a household. So this is, again, often a very selective approach to the text that leave out some verses that could actually undermine the, the criticism that is being leveled. So those are a few things that I'd say as we look at those texts, and perhaps I've gone on longer than necessary, but sometimes no. it's helpful to fill in some of these details. Yeah, that's great. I think about four or five people ask this question. So let me take your metaphor a step further and see where you might go. Somebody would say, okay, if you're an owner of an NBA team, you might speak of a player as a kind of property. It doesn't mean the person is not a human being. That person plays two roles. But if we push back, we might say, well, sure, an NBA owner can't beat their, you know, their players, obviously. And I chuckle because we know that's false. So would you say, no, actually, the Old Testament is fully just the way it is? Or is your view saying, look, we're moving in the right direction towards servants. This might not be ideal, but compared to all other ancient codes and in light of where Israel had been, this is a positive step moving forward. Sure. The emphasis that we see in the in the law of Moses is one it does assume that there are certain structures in place that are less than ideal and we grant that uh, Jesus himself said in Matthew 19:8 that the that Moses permitted certain things because of the hardness of human hearts so we're not arguing that the law of Moses is the uh, absolute legislation for all people at all times this is peculiar to Israel in an ancient Near Eastern setting. And so it takes some of those structures into account. But as I point out in, the, in, this, in my writings and especially in this forthcoming book, the worldview differences between Israel and other ancient Near Eastern nations as you look at their law codes is, 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 is impressive. Hmm. That Israel has a high regard for servants for example, runaway servants who come from other nations that Israelites could have them settle in any of their cities. And uh, there was a code uh, based on the Israel's own history, namely Israel's enslavement in, uh, in, in excruciating circumstances in Egypt, that God reminds the Israelites three dozen times mm-hmm. that, remember, you were once slaves in the land of Egypt. And so because of that, you are to look out for the most vulnerable in the land, namely the orphan, the widow, and the alien. And so there is no justification for mistreating those who are, uh, who are marginalized, those who could be easily taken advantage of. God says he is a defender of those, uh, that God, uh, God is calling on Israel to look out for them rather than to take advantage of them or else God will bring judgment upon them. 
and so these are, and that's part of the curses uh, of uh, you know that that are mentioned in say Leviticus. Also, uh, when it comes to the, you know, we can talk about the the punishments that are allotted sure. for uh, Israelites, and that there's a fundamental equality there. Whereas in other na- ancient Near Eastern nations, you have a hierarchy of punishments based on one status in society. So the lower you are, the more severe the punishment is, and, and that's not the. There's no such differentiation in Israel's uh, law collection. Uh, you also, and I can go on to talk about a, a whole host sure. of things, uh, but but uh, those are just a couple of examples. And I spent two chapters talking about this, uh, that there are indeed significant worldview differences here, how we treat slaves, how we treat foreigners, how we treat, uh, you know, how we mete out punishments, uh, how we look out for the poor, and how we created advantages for them rather than disadvantages of them, in, like in, like charging huge amounts of interest and so forth. Uh, Israelites are not allowed to charge interest for those who are fellow servants. But of course, if somebody wants to come and do business in Israel, then uh, charging interest is permitted uh, for this foreign foreigner who's doing business investing. So sure. so there's that there's that perspective as well. Okay. But uh, so anyway, those are those are some places that I would go. And so I would say that God meets the people where they are, uh, that he doesn't create an ideal standard for them, but he does elevate the standard and seeks to move the Israelites in a redemptive direction, keeping in mind, too, that the biblical vision begins with fundamental equality between male and female, uh, in monogamous marriage, uh, that there is no class distinction, no sexual distinction, no racial distinction, all are made in the image of God. So that is the fundamental groundwork that we're approaching with. And as we tackle some of these questions about uh, laws, uh, you know, Jesus, like I said, uh, Moses permitted certain things because of the hardness of human hearts, not because uh, these were this was ideal legislation across the board. That's super helpful. You have two chapters in Is God More a Monster? And in the new one, Is God a Vindictive Bully? So at some point, maybe we should just do a full show really unpacking slavery because it comes up so much. But what I appreciate you do is all of these passages, and we're about to come to one of the toughest ones in the Old Testament. You say, let's not forget the larger Christian story, the Judeo-Christian ethic, how this frames it. I think that's always helpful. Well, let's move on to Deuteronomy 22, where it seems to be a command to marry a rapist. Uh, this was written in one of the comments. It says, rape is not passion, it's abuse. He will likely continue right. the abuse for her entire life. What are your thoughts on that passage? Yeah, and one of the things that I would point out regarding this passage, and I do touch on this in the, you know, it t- explain it in the Moral Monster book, uh, that you do have in, in this passage mention of a rape just prior, where uh, a man seizes uh, a woman say out in the out in the middle of the country and she obviously cannot get help and so even though she cries out she is not going to be heard and so uh, in this case the 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 person who rapes her would be uh, again be capital capitally punished that is the maximal penal, maximum penalty uh, that is issued here and is mentioned in the text and when you get to this next portion however this is more like you know, the, the term that is used in terms of he he takes her, uh, that is a lesser, less forceful term. Uh, tapas is a less forceful term than chazak, which is mentioned in the previous text where there is a forcible rape. And in this case, too, what's interesting is that not he is found out, the, ra- you know, the, the, the rapist, uh, but rather they are hmm. found out. This looks more like, and you can take a look at Richard Davidson's book called Flame of Yahweh, in which he unpacks this in great detail, uh, that this is a, 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 an example of seduction rather than forcible rape. And as a result of this, of course, the woman's chances, if she is, has been sexually involved with someone, her chances of marrying are greatly diminished within a place like ancient Near East in Asia, near Eastern Israel. And so, so there is a, so he has to pay, if he refused to marry her, he has to pay double uh, the, 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 what's called the bride price, basically, which is the security for the woman he marries, that if something should happen to the man, there is this, uh, this payment that is made to, that gives her insurance, as it were, security uh, in the event of something, ha- something happening. So because of this seduction, 
And if he refused to marry her, uh, and again, th this could be something that, uh, you know, there may be a seducer, but uh, someone will actually, uh, you know, a woman might agree to, uh, to marry someone who has been a seducer. And so there's not, so it'd be more akin perhaps to statutory rape that you can like where there's someone who has in our in our day who has sex with a, a minor uh it's not necessarily you know it's not forcible uh rape like a back alley type of rape but this is something where there is a consent but it is with a minor so it would perhaps be along more along those lines that we're talking about here uh, we don't have an exact parallel uh, between the two but that's more the kind of category that we're looking at and so it doesn't mean that the woman has to. She and her father, who's kind of the, the middleman uh, in this arrangement, uh, can they can decide not to go, go for it. It's not as though this is a requirement. So those are some things that ought to be brought into the discussion uh, because those are typically overlooked. And that's what I'm trying to do in, in my writings to bring some of that background information uh, into the picture. And, you know, and again, sometimes people will say, where's Paul Copen getting this stuff? I'm, I'm reading Old Testament scholars. It's not as though I'm just making this stuff up. Uh, and I've gotten all notable, you know, notable Old Testament scholars who've written endorsements, say, for my forthcoming uh, book, mm. Is God a Vindictive Bully? And people who are at the top of their game, people who are well-respected in the, in the guild of Old Testament scholarship. So take a look at the endorsements. Uh, take a look at those, what they have to say. Uh, take a look at the sources that I cite. I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with people who are critics. I'm interacting with people who, uh, who are, uh, you know, putting out these uh, these challenges, and also interacting with people who have done their homework on biblical scholarship. Uh, so those are a few things to keep in mind as well. Uh, as people sometimes, as they interact with some of my writings, I'll say, "Where did Paul Copan get this stuff? Is he just making this up?" Uh, I'm I'm not just blowing smoke. I'm interacting with scholarship. Fair enough. And your point is not that you're right because you're interacting with scholars. It's exactly. just that you're not making stuff up. You've done your yeah. homework. So if you disagree, go to the sources. Look yeah. them up. There are other people who are, who are saying these sorts of things too. Exactly. Fair enough. Well, let's talk about one that uh, was commented on. I've been asked this a number of times. When you go to the book of Judges, uh, Jephthah, who's a judge, sacrifices his daughter because of an mm -hmm. oath that he makes. How right. could this possibly be just? There are two takes on this, and the majority view is that Jephthah makes a rash vow to offer as a burnt offering whatever comes to him when he uh, emer when he returns home from from battle, and he is victorious, and so he uh, so he comes and he's grieved that his daughter is there to greet him, and the you know then. There's this uh, time of mourning for her and, and so forth. Now, you know, some people, uh, I mean, most scholars will say that this is that he offered her up as a burnt offering, uh, sacrificed her to God, although, again, very misguided, uh, very mistaken. And uh, if you take that viewpoint, uh, we need to keep in mind, of course, you take, take whatever viewpoint you take, sure. uh, to keep in mind that this is the book of Judges, where there is no king in Israel and everyone is doing what is right in his own eyes. And we have example after example of catastrophic actions, immoral actions, uh, really morally compromised characters like Samson and even Gideon. Uh, so there's this real downward slide that you see. And when you get to the final chapters of mm. Judges, it really be, it lo it looks so abysmal and depressing and ends again with that statement that there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So keep that context in mind. Uh, it's not as though everything that is being done in the book of Judges is applauded. Uh, and I interact with other texts in the in the book of Judges uh, that uh, are that that bear this out. Uh, now, there's another take on this. Uh, some some scholars see this as not a burnt offering. Again, it's the minority view. But what is actually being done is that her that his daughter's virginity uh, is is on the line, as it were, that she is basically being uh, kept from any kind of marriage relationship. This is the end of the family line, as it were, because she cannot 
uh, marry because of this vow that he has made. Hmm. And it's interesting that as you keep on reading the text, it emphasizes her virginity. Uh, and it is only during the lifetime of this young woman in which that takes place. So every year they go on up. So it seems like there's there are some scholars who will point out that this seems like a short-lived tradition. And it is also centered on her virginity that she uh, is not going to marry and that this is seen as a great lamentable, greatly lamentable uh, event. So that's a secondary interpretation, but uh, whatever whatever route you go, I think there are ways of understanding this as a as taking place during uh, a terribly immoral, misguided, leaderless time, hmm. and this uh, fits within that picture squarely. I'm not an Old Testament scholar, but the second one feels possible, but more of a stretch to me than the first mm -hmm. one, namely. What you've said in your book, and you said in our last discussion, is we have to be careful to not confuse what the Bible describes with what it prescribes. Exactly. Not only a yeah. foolish vow, vow, but a foolish man, as we saw in some yeah. of the other uh, judges as well. It's really tragic. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Well, let's let's jump down into a question that uh, related to God's own heart. A few people commented right. on this. Yeah, And I'll just sum it up. You can tell me if this is fair, that people have wondered, how can David be a man after God's own heart when he commits adultery and murder and uh, the plague, etc.? One response was his willingness to repent when Nathan confronts him shows amidst his failures, he ultimately has a good heart. The other take that you presented last time was it's not about his internal heart, but the role he plays in carrying out the function of God, so to speak, carries out God's plans. Now, is that fair enough as far as it goes of the two sure, positions? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's the challenge from D is his name. He says, after God, uh, for example, in 1 Samuel 13, it contrasts David with Saul's disregard of God's commands. Samuel says God looks at the heart versus appearance in 1 Samuel 16. And God appears to Solomon and tells him, If you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes, then I will establish a royal line over Israel. This seems to be at least two or three examples where David's heart is referred to as the kind of character he did and actions he made, not just the role that he played. Right. The it's not. I'm not saying that there is no overlap between the two. Uh, you certainly do have David, who is quick to respond, say when he's confronted by Nathan and his uh, challenge to him, and he says, "I have sinned," and Nathan declares that he is forgiven, etc. And you also have, you, know, you have certain passages that do highlight a, a, a sincerity of heart that David has toward God. And we see him in the Psalms and so forth, uh, that there is a lot of uh, spiritual passion, devotion, dedication, and so forth. So we're not at all diminishing that. Uh, but when it comes to this specific phrase, according to one's heart or according to the heart you know it's a uh, the uh, the greek uh, sorry the hebrew preposition uh you know the the kaf plus the word for heart lev which is a kind of the, that's the that's the construction that we are specifically talking about a man after god's own heart or according to god's own heart and i would just encourage someone to do a a study mm. of the preposition plus lev uh heart and see what you come up with. And you'll see repeatedly that that phrase refers to, according, sometimes it's translated according to what you desire. Uh, you know, and so for example, it, when, when Jonathan and his armor bearer are going up to fight against the Philistines, Jonathan spells out his plan and the armor bearer says in 1 Samuel, to do what is according to your heart. So that is what you choose, what you what what you have desired. So it's not a matter of say moral character here, 
but rather it is according to what one has chosen to do, what one desires. Uh, we see this in uh, in the in the Psalms. We you know, Psalm uh, Psalm twenty, uh, verse four. That same construction is used. It's according to that uh, person's desires. Uh, that we see you know, that sort of a thing in in other places as well. Uh, even when uh, when David is told by Nathan that uh, you know go ahead and build the house of the Lord, when he's finally told by Nathan, uh, who gave some you know, I don't know good good well meaning advice, but turned out not to be in accordance with God's heart, uh, that he said David is recognizing and satisfied with God's verdict that Solomon is the one who is going to be uh, doing the building of the temple according to your heart. You know, so he's talking to God about, you know, this is according to your desire. And even when you look at that passage in 1 Samuel 16, where, the, uh, where David's brothers are being evaluated, uh, you know, looked at by, by Samuel, and eventually David is anointed as king. But the first one, Samuel thinks, oh, surely the Lord's anointed is before him, this, you know, Eliab. And so he says, you know, don't look at the outward appearance because, you know, you know God is choosing a man after his own, you know, you know, God is looking for a man after his own heart. It's actually mentioned earlier. But that's the point is don't judge by the outward appearance. Uh, but rather there's something that could be internal uh, that is that is in view here. Uh, and so we're not, like I said, negating that there couldn't be some, you know, that there isn't a potential character element here. But if you're looking at the specific mention of uh, what is going on with uh, David and how that phrase is used uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, we see that that is the more appropriate use, uh, even if you do have some overlap. Mm -hmm. That's a very helpful and careful distinction that I would expect from a philosopher like you, Paul. Uh, very helpful. Well, there's a few more tough ones here that people have. And this came from two people. I did my best to combine the question. came from John and three little Fonzies. And here's essentially what they said. Dr. Copan says that only murder couldn't have capital punishment commuted to payment. But where's this possibility option indicated in the text? So number one, where does the text actually say that? But then they follow up and say, wouldn't it be a sin for the Israelites to adjust the law of God to be less severe when in several places indicates capital punishment is meant to be preventative? And they give a couple examples. Number 15, Numbers 15, working on the Sabbath, Leviticus 24, a blasphemer. Seems right. these were taken literally Sure. not just hyperbolic wake-up calls, as you seem to indicate. Right. Yeah, and I have, uh, I mentioned that, I think I even mentioned it in my last uh, last talk, that there are two, uh, two instances. It's kind of like the, as Israel is as this fledgling nation, uh, where you have these two very strong uh, reminders to the Israelites that, uh, that God is not to be tinkered with, uh, not to be uh, tampered with and, and taken lightly. Um, kind of like Ananias and Sapphira being struck down uh, in the early days of the church to send an important message to the, the people uh, that, again, uh, these sorts of things are not to be taken lightly, uh, that, uh, that God, is, uh, God is not mocked in this, uh, in this process. He, you will not get away with it. So, so you do have two very, uh, very clear instances of capital punishment. Uh, what I try to do is look at the ancient Near East as well as Israel, and I spend a chapter looking at the uh, these capital punishments in the ancient Near East, and then two chapters uh, looking at them in the in the Old Testament. One in the Pentateuch itself, and the other uh, in language that relates to you know, again where you might expect capital punishment, but you actually don't find it uh, with regard to adultery. And I I, I track that through. But uh, um, Walter Kaiser, like I said, I'm not just blowing smoke mm -hmm. here, uh, that uh, Walter Kaiser uh, mentions that there are 15 out of 16 cases where capital punishment can be, uh, something that's potentially capital, capitally punishable, can be commuted to payment. But there's one strictly mentioned, you know, again, uh, highlighted instance where you cannot use ransom payment to redeem a person, and that is when there is intentional murder, that this was the exception. Uh, and so you could not commute payment. And so that's from, you know, Numbers 35, uh, where, where you could, you know, and, and Walter Kaiser says that this is generally taken by scholars, 
biblical scholars, Old Testament scholars, as indicating that there, there could be, that other payments could be commuted, but this could not be. And even when you look at some of the literal, uh, you, you, know, the, you know, what seems to be literal, you know, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, uh, well, you don't see those things happening. Like a servant whose eye is gouged out, the, the person who struck him, his eye isn't gouged out, his tooth mm. isn't knocked out. And so, you know, but when there is a murder, that is one place where there is not an exception that is permitted. And, and as I, I, I look at various cases and I talk about uh, adultery in the that's mentioned in the law of Moses, uh, and also in you know like in the book of Proverbs where you have a, a, a person who has been engaged in a, in an adulterous relationship with another man's wife, and the uh, and the the there is mention of you know, and typically this is how things were resolved in the in the land of Israel that it was not seen this wasn't the sort of thing that was just taken to the to the judge to the courts uh, but it was resolved between families and if you had a husband who is jealous and and demanded some sort of a uh, capital punishment then that would be permitted but generally speaking there was payment that came as a result of this. And so I, I, I highlight a number of instances in the, both of those chapters that look at the Pentateuch, uh, you know, specifically, and also, you know, the, the book of Moses, the law of Moses, and then beyond to see how, say, adultery uh, was treated. And it was not something that was taken to the, there's plenty of adultery, uh, but it's not treated in a way that just takes it to the judge and there is a death penalty. Uh, and so that was, and again, like I said, I'm not, I, I follow people like you know John Golden Gay and others who uh, who make this clear. So it's a it's a it's a general agreement here uh, in in biblical scholarship. You know, Preston Sprinkle, John Golden Gay, uh, you know um, uh, J.J. Finkelstein and others who recognize that these are exaggerated uh, um, punish you know exaggerated mention stoning burning and so forth. But the expectation was not that they would be carried uh, carried out uh, in a in a in a literal fashion. Like I said, you do have a couple of instances okay. of that, but as you see it played out, uh, it's 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 it just isn't the case in in ancient Israel. It's more the exception than it is the norm, yeah. or the expectation. Okay, I see a couple comments here that say, "Is this pre-recorded?" No, this is live. Uh, mm -hmm. We are taking questions because we invited last week when we walked through Paul's upcoming book, tough objections, and we're taking them. But when we get to the end, we will take two or three questions. So think you're going to write the question in caps and then state your question as quickly as possible so we can get right to it. Uh, but we'll do that towards the end. I've got a few more for you here, Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. Lori says, how is killing children ever right? How is killing children ever right? The, a, a couple of things to, to keep in mind here, and I don't know what she has in mind here. Uh, perhaps could it be the flood of Noah? And I did talk about that uh, last last time. Uh, that, you know, again, in that, say, judgment, there is a kind of a God finishing the job that human beings began in terms of turning the world violent, uh, it becoming a, a point of no return. And so there is that kind of a finishing off and God starting over. Uh, and again, it's regrettable, although keep in mind that, uh, that God is the author of life and he can take life as he chooses. Uh, God, you know, God, does not, God does not have commands or duties to follow. It doesn't mean that there is no good character behind those commands. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that we can always understand what God's act, that God's actions are uh, perfectly in line with our own moral sensibilities. Sometimes our moral sensibilities need to be corrected. But there are certainly tough passages. I'm not denying that. And a lot of people who maybe write, uh, you know, or make comments, uh, they think, "Oh, uh, Copan's acting as though all these problems are easily resolvable." No, I'm not saying that at all. There, are, as I mentioned in in my book, uh, you know, the Vindictive Bully book, there are ragged edges. There are places where I wish sure. we could have uh, fuller, deeper, more exhaustive answers than we do. But uh, sometimes my answers are going to be a bit more. Uh, along the lines of something more suggestive or giving a context for it, uh, seeing that there is uh, there are some considerations here that often go unnoticed when this question is being raised. And so God, of course, uh, he life belongs to him. He can take life as he chooses and that he is not under some sort of a moral obligation. Uh, duties, basically, you know, God's commands are our duties. So God doesn't command himself 
to do something that is that is moral moral command god simply because he is good he uh, acts and those things that he does are good morally justifiable etc uh, now there are some places for example a couple of times in in the book of jeremiah where it talks about infant sacrifice and god says that this practice of infant, infant sacrifice that is the israelites are getting lured into he said I neither commanded it, nor did it even enter my mind. In other words, this is so far removed from God's moral character that it's as though God couldn't even predict, couldn't have even predicted that this sort of a thing would happen. So there are some things that God cannot do, uh, that God will not command. Uh, you know, God, for example, we're told, you know, God cannot lie. Uh, we're told repeatedly uh, you know, that he is a covenant-keeping God. He will not break his covenant, so that God will keep the oath that he has made. So these are the, there are some things that God will indeed not violate. And there are also, some people think, oh, if God you know, does something that is terrible, you know, that seems terrible to us at least, uh, that we we say, oh, that's that's the very character of God. Keep in mind, these are actually exceptions to what God desires to do. God will sometimes say that's enough, and He will bring judgment. But it's not as though this is God's heart's desire. Uh, that these are exceptions rather than the the moral rule uh, by which, God, as it, as it were, God operates. That this is not the norm. This is not the standard. Uh, God is reluctant and unwilling to bring judgment. But there comes a time when he says that's enough and uh, and, and proceeds with judgment. Uh, and a lot of times this kind of a judgment comes, as I said, within the context of other people being uh, degraded, dehumanized, uh, treated violently and so forth. And so for God not to get angry would be problematic that we uh, that that this anger or this passionate concern is it comes out of God's concern for other human beings who are being treated with such disregard uh, that their that their uh, that their dignity being made in the image of God is being violated and so on, uh, so those are the sorts of things that uh, perhaps I could bring in and maybe the um, uh, what is being asked here. Lori is asking about the the question of the Canaanites and what about those children and so forth. Well, I, I take a different view than perhaps what is traditionally understood uh, that uh, this is not in view. Uh, and that sometimes even where you see man, woman, young and old, uh, there are no women or children there. And I gave an example from uh, from Numbers 21, where you have a battle against these two kings. And the text mentions in Numbers 21, it mentions the king, his sons and his army. Uh, but when you get to Deuteronomy, which engages in this intensification or exaggeration, it recounts that battle in chapters two and three, but throws in man, woman, young and old, which is part of that. Uh, hyperbole or exaggeration, uh, even though they were not present. So uh, I go into a lot more detail in the book, and so I'd encourage you to, to just uh, be patient with me uh, uh, in this shorter answer. Uh, take a look and feel free to drop me a note through my website if you have questions, and if I can uh, try to address them, I'll be happy to do that. That's really helpful and fair, and I think this is a fair question to ask, whether it's in the Canaanite destruction, whether it's in the flood. Either way, there's the destruction of children. Now, this doesn't answer it. And you do this more so in a moral monster than than in is God a vindictive bully is asked a question. Where does that moral sense and objective standard that even taking the life of an innocent child comes from? We right. see child sacrifice throughout the history of the world. We see in ancient Rome, you don't want a child. You just go leave it out in, you know, in sure. the elements. And yet there was something about the Judeo-Christian tradition that came to fruition in the person of Jesus that right. values all life in the womb, mm -hmm. out of the womb, young, old, black, white, mm -hmm. etc., mm -hmm. that sure. we can't ignore. Uh, yeah. With that said, let's keep going. Here's a, okay. an interesting one I want to get your take on here. This came from uh, Incredulous Pasta, who I think is joining us in the live stream as well. So let me read this okay. one. It says, uh, Dr. Copan asked, is there anything that could show up in the Bible that is so immoral based on our moral instincts that you wouldn't give mm -hmm. a pass to God? His answer right. was unclear to me. So let me frame it this way. Uh, you and I have used the example. Our friend Bill Craig has used the example mm -hmm. that if someone doesn't believe in objective right and wrong, use the most clear example such as torturing an innocent child for fun. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you can't see that that's wrong, mm -hmm. 
You need a therapist, right. not an argument. So in that case, right. our moral instincts are clear. Is your yeah. point when it comes to the Bible, like if there was that in the Bible, we'd say, all right, go with my instincts, overturn the Bible. Like how far would you take that moral instinct? And would you say, we see things in the Bible that are jarring, but not to the level of torture an innocent child mm -hmm. for fun? Right. Yeah, and, and that, that, that would be one example, um, you know, raping someone for fun. Uh, we would, uh, you know, we could we could talk about the, um, you know, the example that I just gave of the the practice of infant sacrifice. Uh, God says it did not even enter my mind. So clearly, God is distancing Himself from that practice. Uh, we also see God who is engaged in, you know, well, God swearing by Himself because there's nothing greater to swear by. And he is one who says he will be faithful to his covenant, that he will not violate that covenant. Uh, he will be a God of his word. And Hebrews tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. Mm -hmm. So those are some things that are, uh, you know, that we could, we could, we could mention here. So, uh, so again, if there are some things that are morally, uh, you know, that are, you know, we, maybe I should back up. We should distinguish between that which is morally difficult okay. and exceptional and that which is morally impossible. There are clearly things that God does not, would not command because of his intrinsic goodness. Uh, and keep in mind, as Sean, you were saying, that the very, the very structure of human, you know, of, of our own moral constitution uh, as human beings. Uh, where did that come from? If there is no God, uh, if we're simply the product, say, of, of naturalistic, uh, deterministic physical forces, how does value emerge from valueless processes? Uh, where does, you know, if you use the argument from evil, well, how does your worldview actually address the matter of evil? Uh, evil is a departure from the way things ought to be but if there is no God, hmm. there is no way things ought to be. Uh, there is no basis for saying this is the blueprint, this is the design plan, and any deviation from that is evil or wrong. Nature just is what it is. And, uh, and, and so how can we argue against it? As Richard Dawkins says, you know, we just dance to the music of our DNA. There is no good or evil. There's nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That is the fundamental worldview that we're dealing with in naturalism. So, so the question is, I, I think there's a deeper concern that the naturalist has to have in contrast to the theist, even with some of these uh, difficulties that we're talking about right now. Uh, where does goodness come from? Uh, where does, you know, how do we differentiate good and evil? Well, like C.S. Lewis said, we can't determine uh, the, the crookedness of a stick unless we have an idea of what straight is. And furthermore, if there is a God who exists, then he guarantees that cosmic justice will be done, hmm. that Hitler and Mother Teresa uh, won't just simply, you know, that won't simply be the end of the story. God guarantees that justice will be done. God also guarantees that tears will be wiped away from our eyes, that what we cannot understand in this moment, uh, you know, and we can offer some, some answers, but what we can understand in this moment, God guarantees that those will be resolved in the world to come. So if you're expecting everything to be resolved in this life alone, well, that presupposes there is no immortality. Uh, but if there is a God, there is a mortality, mm -hmm. there is judgment, there is comfort and relief as well. And so if we get rid of God, we only exacerbate our problems. It's sort of like what Peter said in, in, uh, at the end of John 6, where, Je where followers uh, are leaving Jesus, and he asks his own disciples, are you also going to leave me? And Peter says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? Hmm. You alone have the words of eternal life. So, uh, so we're, we're dealing with difficulties across the board. And as I look at theism or biblical theism compared to the alternatives, there is a lot more to work with, given a theistic understanding, a biblical understanding of the image of God, the goodness of God, uh, evil as a departure from the way things ought to be, cosmic justice, and also in Jesus Christ, God stepping into this world, getting his feet dirty and hands bloody to rescue us out of our misery, out of evil, uh, to, to bring about reconciliation with God, to guarantee that uh, evil will not have the last word. Mm -hmm. Well said. Again, I appreciate that you framed this. I've got a couple more for you. And then let's take some live questions.
I've seen some great questions come up and you might have to copy and paste them at the bottom so I can keep track, but just be ready as we get to kind of the last, I don't know, maybe six, eight, 10 minutes to post those. And I'll take those that I see quickly that are succinct. Uh, and there's some great ones coming up. There's also been a couple comments about David and Bathsheba's child being struck down mm -hmm. at seven right. days old. We talked yeah. about last time how the sins of the father, so to speak, are not projected onto the next generation. People right. should be punished for their own sins. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a contradiction? Is this an exception? What's your take on that? Right. Yeah, I mean, of course, there are general ways in which God operates and that those who are, uh, say, the, the next generation shouldn't be uh, punished uh, or judged for that which the fathers have done. And so we see that in Deuteronomy, we see that in Ezekiel, we see that in Jeremiah. Uh, so that is a theme in Scripture. Uh, there, so there is not, so the guilt that is rendered is for those who have actually perpetrated the wrong. There is guilt that is involved. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a consequence that comes with someone's wrong action. Uh, David uh, pronounced that there should be a fourfold judgment, uh, that, that this person should pay back four times, you know, in that parable that, uh, that Nathan told, that, he, that uh, this rich man takes this poor man's lamb that is like a daughter to him, and uses that when a guest comes to visit the rich man and slaughters the, the lamb and they eat the lamb that uh, was uh, such a precious, mm -hmm. precious uh, you know, possession uh, uh, to this, this poor man. And David says, you know, that man must die. You know, he must pay back fourfold for what he has done. Well, turns out that there is a fourfold death that comes to David's household. So, uh, so you have the death that come, you know, comes four times over to his offspring. So it is, in a sense, he has pronounced it. And there is a very difficult, powerful point that is being made here uh, that what David is called for is actually he is the one who is the perpetrator of it. And to drive the point home, uh, his own uh, little child uh, is, is, you know, he ends up dying. Uh, so, so there is, uh, there are some of these things that are, you know, like I said, there, there, are, there are harsh and difficult texts. God, of course, is the author of life. It's not as though that's the final word on the child and as though uh, there, there couldn't be you know, redemption or rescue uh, in the afterlife for this little one. Uh, so that's a, that's a separate theological question that we could unpack if we'd, if we'd like. Uh, but, uh, but again, God is the one who is the giver of life. As Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And that the, these are the sorts of things that are his prerogative rather than being left up to, uh, you know, to human beings who, uh, you know, who don't have the authority of life. They're not the source of life as God is. And so there are certain things that are, that are say, hedges to us or certain things that uh, certain boundaries that we have that God himself does not have. I mean, eventually all of us will die. Uh, and so, so that is the sort of thing that we also need to keep in mind that, uh, you know, our times are not in our own hands. Okay. Super, super helpful. Uh, one more question for you. Uh, this one came in as a comment, then we're going to take a few lives. So those of you watching, make sure you have caps with questions and just state your question as succinctly as possible. This is a question someone wrote in the comments of our last video. He said, in 2 Samuel 21, David takes seven of Saul's and hands them, sons of Saul, and hands them over to be hanged by the Gibeonites to pay for the sins of Saul, who killed the Gibeonites during his reign. The Bible right. says the sins of father will not fall upon his sons. How is it just to kill seven innocent sons of Saul for the sins of Saul? This seems to follow up naturally from our last question. Right. Well, there is a, again, uh, you know, we would like to have tidier answers on these sorts of things. And as I said, we're not here to give uh, tidy answers or even to approve everything uh, that takes place in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, what you have here, of course, the Gibeonites, uh, there's a pact made by the, uh, you know, between Joshua and the Gibeonites uh, in, in Joshua chapter 9, uh, even though through, uh, through devious means, uh, they wrangled a, an arrangement between Israel and the Gibeonites, and they did not renege on that promise. They, throughout the generations, maintained a, 
protection of the Gibeonites. They preserved that covenant, that treaty that was made, and that no harm was to come to the Gibeonites. In fact, when the uh, when other kings rose up because of this alliance made between Israel and the Gibeonites, they you know, the, the, the Gibeonites appealed to Joshua saying, please don't leave us alone, don't abandon us. And so Joshua fights and does not, you know, on their behalf, they, you know, they're, they're part of this, uh, you know, in defending Israel as well as the Gibeonites uh, engaged in this warfare. So it was a, you know, a defensive measure in this case to protect the Gibeonites from assault. Uh, but yet that was not honored or respected. Saul violated that covenant. And so the question then is, again, we're dealing with the ancient Near East and certain things that were uh, taken for granted or understood that if you do certain things, if you act treacherously, this sort of a thing uh, is, you know, may impact your, your own family. Uh, you may uh, engage in this. Again, this is, this is unique. It's not as though this is, say, written in the law of Moses or something like that. Uh, but again, there is some sort of a penalty that needed to be issued. And Saul, who had been responsible for this, uh, is, you know, there is judgment that comes to his own uh, family uh, be, because of that. Uh, and so there is this picture of how is this wrong going to be atoned for? Is it just saying, oh, well, too bad, that's what happened. Well, in the ancient Near East, uh, things were much more, uh, you know, there, there was that understanding uh, that something has to pay for this. There has to be some sort of a uh, payment that is made for the wrong, for the evil that has been done. So that's, th that's the, the mindset that we're working with here. Uh, it's uh, different in our day, of course, okay. but, uh, but again, we need to understand that kind of a backdrop and, uh, and rather than superimposing our own standards of today, which have been affected by the, uh, the Jewish Christian worldview, hmm. uh, that we shouldn't uh, you know, go back and say, well, that should have been different. That should have been done differently. Uh, receive it as being from within the time in which it happens. There are fallen ancient Near Eastern structures. God works within them, uh, even though they're not ideal. Good response. Here's a question. Let's take a few live questions here in the time that we have from fernando sanchez he says why does god allow satan not only to exist but defy him such as in jesus's temptation giving him access to his throne he's our accuser day and night he even tempts god in the job story why is he so special why wouldn't god just wipe him out at the beginning yeah these are of course uh, questions that are momentous that are being asked by theologians and uh, and philosophers and so forth. Uh, why doesn't God just uh, wipe things out? Why doesn't God just uh, get rid of evil and so forth? So it really does bring us to the problem of evil, uh, that God, for his own purposes, to uh, to perhaps even highlight the, his own uh, greater purposes. For example, in Jesus on the cross, you think, uh, you know, Satan thinks he is getting uh, the final word, uh, that he is the one who is, uh, is, is having the, the final say with regard to Jesus' fate, that, uh, that Jesus, even through weakness, through death on a shameful cross, as Colossians 2 tells us, triumphs over those evil powers, leading them in this procession, uh, that they're like the, the, the captives behind him, and that they are following in this train as the you know, as the losers in this battle, uh, with the victor uh, leading uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this march, and and that's often how God works. That God takes those things that seem to be, uh, you know, you know, for you know for you know for evil. Those things that you know, and God is able to bring about His own good, bring out redemption. And, uh, and, and fulfill his purposes through all of those things, as, uh, as Genesis 50, 20 reminds us. The full answer, we don't know. Uh, okay. we, we recognize that God allows freedom, creaturely freedom, and that includes uh, the creaturely freedom of fallen angels, not just human beings. So that's part of the broader picture of uh, free will. Um, but it doesn't mean that Satan uh, has, has total control, uh, that Satan, of course, is not equal to God, that he is under God. And as Revelation tells us, uh, he is on a leash. Uh, he knows that his time is short, that, is, uh, that, uh, that he, is, he is doomed. For, as Martin Luther said, for lo, his doom is sure. Uh, 
And th that's the confidence that we have, that evil will not have the final word, even when you have someone like Satan involved. Uh, good response. Here's a question from Roy Higgins. Uh, thanks for joining, Roy. I've seen you here a number of times. He asks a fair question. I've been asked many times. Why isn't abortion the most moral thing that could ever happen since all babies go to heaven? No risk of hell would ever be the outcome for any of them. Now, of course, this assumes you hold the view that all babies go to heaven. So what's your view on babies who would be aborted or maybe who died in the flood? And then follow mm -hmm. up, if they go to heaven, wouldn't we assume that things like abortion would be the most moral because we guarantee they go to heaven? Well, of course, uh, as, Paul, as Paul writes, uh, shall we do evil that good may come? Uh, may it never be. And mm. what if, you know, and so we can, we can talk about uh, people who, for example, say, uh, you know, we'll read about uh, people who uh, murder their children and their rationalization is, well, you, the, your, the, your life would have been, you know, miserable. Uh, their life would have, life would have been miserable. I couldn't see them going forward in this world or uh, they, there were just so few options and so forth. And so uh, I wanted to do this in order to bring them to something that would have been better. And, and maybe uh, they're, they're, they were, so to speak, spared uh, all kinds of misery uh, because of a, you know, this premature death. Uh, but again, that's that's not the sort of things that is in our hands to take care of. Uh, that death and life are not in our power. Uh, that is not our prerogative. And so, this sort of a thing is where uh, where we where we confuse the the ends and the you know and the means the the ends being uh, you know justified by by how we do things. And of course, that's part of the. You know, there's there's the, the moral question is not simply in terms of the outcome. The, con the consequences are important, of course, uh, but there's also the means by which we uh, th that we exert to get there. Uh, and furthermore, uh, what if it's the case that God, uh, knowing, you know, who you know, I mean, we talk about uh, you know who would be aborted and who would, uh, you know, who would not. Um, we you know we could simply talk about God, uh, you know, that you know in in His economy uh, will bring into His kingdom. Uh, indeed, those that have not been able to make a decision about right and wrong and so forth, uh, that this is something that uh, that he graciously gives. And again, we have to be careful about assuming that, oh, uh, you know, I can do this and, and bring them to heaven. Well, keep in mind that heaven is itself a gracious gift and not something to be presumed upon either. But those are just a couple of responses. I could go into more detail. I, I, I you know, um, haven't written on this topic, but uh, perhaps sure. it would be something I take up. Well, you, you, you do a lot of depth in uh, both of your books, and especially your new one. Here's one that might just bring some clarity as to your approach. We talked about this last time, uh, but Paul Wood, Paul, nice to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. He says, do you buy or accept Greg Boyd's hermeneutic that assigns Old Testament violence to ancient Near East culturally conditioned authors? So maybe as a whole, you consider Greg Boyd a critic from within, not a critic from without. Maybe just mm -hmm. kind of highlight the different approaches that you take and why you take yours. I realize you take multiple chapters to go through this, but just one yeah. or two key points so people can see the difference uh, within the larger Christian faith about how people are approaching these tough texts. Right. Uh, a, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that uh, violence in the Old Testament is ascribed to human beings rather than to God. Uh, so, so that's, you know, so God acts justly to bring about his purposes and he is not violent. Uh, that is ascribed to evil human beings. Uh, secondly, I do take uh, issue with Greg Boyd. I consider him a brother in Christ, but I think he is uh, missing the mark in terms of how the New Testament understands the Old Testament. Uh, and, and some of the, I, I think he's creating a gap between the actual God and the textual God. He sees the actual God mm. as revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross in particular, when he's loving his enemies saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Well, keep in mind in the law of Moses, we also see enemy love. Your enemy's ox is in the ditch, uh, you help him out. Uh, so it's, and if your enemy is hungry, uh, Proverbs 25, uh, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. So it's not as though Jesus came up with that. He's drawing on the Old Testament. Uh, but, but when it comes to Greg Boyd's own uh, hermeneutic, when he says that this, when it says this is what the Lord says, 
is not always what the Lord is saying. Uh, there's some, some serious problems here. And what I do in my book is, and I say this for the last uh, chapter, the third to the last chapter, but it's dealing with the, my final chapters. I address those critics from within like Greg Boyd, where he, li- where he talks about, oh, this is what the textual God says, that oath-taking was evil, uh, or that uh, capital punishment was, uh, was you know, evil, but it's seen by the ancient author or prophet as you know, who has fallen and violence prone and so forth. But that's just the textual, literary, fictitious rendering of God, not the actual God who is loving and so forth. Well, what I do is I look at these sorts of texts and I, I lay, the, uh, lay the textual God and the actual God uh, next to each other, according to Greg Boyd. And then I look at other passages that actually show, no, these actually coincide. So at least at those points that Greg Boyd is mentioning, there is no differentiation between the actual God and the textual God. So we see uh, punishments, you know, in the, in, the witnesses of, in, the, in the presence of two or three witnesses that a person, you know, could be justly punished or put to death, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. Uh, and you see these sorts of mentions that Greg Boyd just kind of glosses over them or doesn't even include a number of texts that I bring up in his index at all. There, there, a lot of stuff is missing. There are a lot of gaps that Greg Boyd leaves uh, in how he renders this. And so he doesn't really grapple with some of those key texts that actually are in the New Testament and elsewhere uh, that re- would really undermine his position. So I do indeed challenge that actual versus textual God distinction that Greg Boyd makes. Gotcha. Now, I'm not denying that there isn't some sort of a, uh, you know, some sort of a, an acknowledgement that these laws in the Old Testament are less than ideal, uh, but again, they're not evil. And and that's something that I'd want to highlight. So Paul, if I'm not mistaken, you've written three books on the character Mm -hmm. of the Old Testament God. Mm -hmm. Are you done? Are you finished? You got more in the tank Mm -hmm. to tackle on these tough (laughs) questions. Well, let's see where things go. This was, uh, you know, 11 years in the making, as it were, mm. uh, after the uh, Moral Monster book. And of course, uh, Matthew Flanagan and I, we did Did God Really Command Genocide, which is a, an extensive treatment about uh, on violence in the Old Testament. So a very wide ranging treatment. And so what I'm trying to do in this, this book is trying to build on what I've done, but add a lot more material. And and so I'm trying to avoid as much overlap as possible. But we'll see how things go beyond this point. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a, a another volume uh, in the offing that comes this, but it, it may be a little while. Well, fair enough. This book that's coming out, you sent me the PDF, but I'm looking forward to getting a physical copy and working through it yet again to really think through your explanations. Oh, there they it is. Been, they have been. Uh, hold where hold we it are. right in the there, middle there. Go, so. Is God a vindictive bully? You got an early copy, which you deserve for writing mm-hmm. this thing. Uh, well done. And again, Thank believer you. or skeptic, uh, it's easy to come to these passages and say slavery, immoral, and just write it off quickly. But are you willing to probe in, look at the context, the historical context? Uh, which you unpack in the book, which is really helpful. And it takes some time and thought not only to write a book, but also for people to really wrestle with these ideas. So appreciate your research. We super appreciate you at Biola. Need to have you out to teach a class on this. Sign me up. All right, good. That's awesome. We've had you come in the past. Students always love just your energy and your insights. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we we will do that for sure. Those of you watching, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other conversations like this coming up, including a conversation with a leading Protestant and a leading Catholic on some of the toughest questions of sexual ethics and a theology of the body. Where do Catholics and Protestants have common ground? Where do we differ on things like birth control, uh, even things like vasectomies? Some of these real questions people are asking today. So make sure you hit subscribe. And if you thought about studying apologetics, this topic of the character of God is one we spend a lot of time on our program. Our Biola Distance program is the top rated program. And you can do it entirely from a distance. Information is below. We would love, love to have you. Paul, can't thank you enough, brother. Always enjoy it. Always learn. And uh, thanks for great work. Again, those watching, pre-order a copy of Is God a Vindictive Bully? And look at these arguments for yourself.